Hello, good morning. We will begin in a few minutes, in approximately uh, a few minutes time, three minutes time. Thank you so much for bearing with us, our virtual guests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, we know, okay. Yeah, I'm muted. Muted and the camera's off. Is that good? Muted camera off, sound off. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, <laughs> um, many thanks for coming to today's market briefing and those joining us online. Obviously, it's a tough time because our wonderful Prime Minister has told us all to be socially distant again um, soon, but I hope. But many thanks to those turning up live, etc. Anyway. Computer said no, sorry. So, um, this is CPD accredited. Um, you get one hour towards your professional personal finance um, certification. Um, you're all registered online. We've kept a note of your names and we can always send you a certificate if you need need to. Just send myself or Katie, who sent the invite around, an, an email. So, there's no problem there. Um, the information, now, this is slightly different as opposed to we do not have a formal presentation. So we've got a QA. and a So the information contained in the presentations, apart from when Wei Yang does the uh, cash reports, uh, expressed by those um, presenters and not necessarily there of a Qualis Roma LOC. Um, obviously, Chatham House rules apply. So please, um, what stays goes in the room, stays in the room, essentially, especially if it's any bad things about me. Um, so what are we going to learn today? Um, looking at the points, and it all depends really what you guys ask. So this is a moving piece, but our plans for what you may learn are a global perspective of marine casualties. Um, I should get glasses, so I can't read this. Trends in marine casualties, repair trends, developments in the salvage industry, and changes within the surveying community. Um, and obviously there's been a few of those over the past short period of time. Um, obviously, one of the more important things is that um, we are signatory of the Neptune Declaration to, um, for seafarers, and we would recommend that any, if you have that influence with any of your companies, please do uh, ask them to, to, to do this. Anyway, so I'll introduce, I'll introduce all the speakers later, but um, in the meantime, I'll introduce Wei Yang, who's going to do the case report. So we're doing this lopsided this week. Right, thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the December Rex Files. So uh, the ABL case reports, the purpose of this section of the briefing is to simply keep you updated on some of the recent higher cost incidents that ABL has been involved in, and in doing so, show you the sorts of incidents and casualties that can happen in shipping and marine operations. 
These feature largely, but not exclusively, hull and machinery casualties, and these are with estimated costs of repair in excess of 250,000, usually excluding the salvage costs. They cover only a subset of the total ABL case load, and this is typically in the order of 10%. Uh, it's an important subset, which represents about 25% of the hull machinery cases by number, and about 65 to 75% of the hull machinery cases that we survey by cost. The estimated costs are often preliminary and subject to further inspections or investigations. In presenting these case reports for last month, it's not about attributing blame. There won't be specifics of cause, as many of the cases are still fresh and it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. And in many cases, the cause is still under investigation. A copy of this presentation or a previous one is available on request. And as usual, let's start with some statistics. Starting on the left hand of our chart, the majority of cases we were instructed on in November were engine room ER machinery cases that you can see. The, uh, there were also a couple of roundings, a fire explosion case, a couple of elisions. Uh, then as we move to the right hand of the chart, a tail shaft seal case and a couple of other cases uh, on a fuel oil pipe and a plow arm damage case. In terms of costs for November, we can see that the engine room machinery cases dominated the figures for the month, while the remainder made up relatively smaller proportion of the costs. The average cost for the month is approximately half a million, which is much lower than last month's average total, about 2.9 million, which was the highest since April. The typical annual background expected figure is about 1 million per high cost casualty when extremes of over 50 million are excluded. The overview of 2021 to date uh, shows that engine room machinery cases still continue to be the most common cases that we work on. And this graph shows that they also continue to be healthy instructions on a variety of work, uh, including on groundings, fire explosions, collision elisions, and others, other cases also adding relatively more to the total. This uh, graph, uh, that you see now looks at the total cost for the year and shows that fire explosion cases still exceed the high cost sinking cases that previously dominated the chart this year. And that's followed by engine machinery cases and other cases. The annual cost distribution is mainly comprised a bit over 30% in fire explosions, about another 25% in sinkings and capsizes, around 18% in engine room machinery cases and almost 11% in others so far for 2021 today. The overall average cost for the year for our high cost ca uh, cases currently sits at just under 1.5 million. All right, let's move on and look at some of our cases in a bit more detail from last month. First up for November is this elision with an outer pier breakwater by an approximately 6,000 deadweight ton general cargo vessel. It was reported that the vessel was on passage with a cargo of approximately 4,650 metric tons of cement and seven crew on board. Also, a pilot in Bark the vessel uh, upon arrival. Strong winds of west southwest 30 knots were prevalent together with a strong tide and a quarterly, uh, quarterly swell. When approaching the harbor and as the vessel passed the bar, the bow started to swing easily to starboard, and that was towards the pier breakwater. Efforts were made by the pilot to prevent contact, including applying hard to port helm and increasing speed to floor ahead. Once it was apparent that the contact was unavoidable, full stern was applied by the master, reducing speed to a reported 3.5 knots. However, the vessel alighted with the inner section of the outer pier breakwater. There was no mechanical malfunction reported. The vessel sustained damage to the bow plating and was hauled up forwards with some water ingress evident. As the vessel's pump, pumps could cope with the ingress, the vessel continued to berth all fast alongside. The cargo was discharged and following inspection by class and the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency counter pollution salvage officer, the vessel was permitted to depart on a single voyage to a repair port. And as pointed out, the breakwater comprises uh, of um, piles of concrete and rocks rather than being a singularly formed jetty. No damage was reported to the breakwater, although it was dark at the time of the contact and no letter of protest from the harbor has been received. The following extent of damage was found. The stem bar was variably distorted, twisted, missing between frames 123 to 130. The shell plating in way of the four peak tank was also indented. On the port bow from frame 119 to frame 129, various damages included shell plating and internals heavily indented, cracked and holed in areas from half a meter square to approximately three meters by five meters in size. Four anodes on the port side were also missing or ripped off. 
uh, on the starboard bow from frame 116 to 129. Various damages also included shell plating and internals heavily indented, cracked and holed in areas, half a meter square to approximately three meters by five meters in size. At frames 117 to 118, for the emergency fire pump seawater suction pipe on the bottom shell connection, the pipe connection to the bottom shell was fractured and heavily distorted in way of the void beneath the bow thrust. Also, for the tank top connection, the pipe connection to the void tank top was fractured with the tank top slightly set up. At frames 106 to 110, for the bottom, bottom side starboard, the shell plating and internals were heavily indented in two areas, each approximately 0.8 meters by 2.5 meters in size. Temporary repairs were required. Shoreside welders attended the dry dock and welded over the fractures in the welded connection between the emergency fire pump C suction pipe and the bow thrust room void space tank top. Although the void space beneath remained breached, this temporary repair prevented further ingress into the bow thrust compartment. This temporary repair was required to allow the vessel to sail to a repair port. The vessel entered dry docks for permanent repairs with all required services connected. A joint inspection was undertaken where the external shell areas to be cropped were agreed. It is noted once the void space beneath the bow thrust is cropped away, the internal connection to the thrusted tunnel needs to be thoroughly checked to see if any damage or misalignment has occurred. No formal written allegation of cause has been made in respect of this damage with owner's investigation into the incident still in progress. The estimated time for repairs is four weeks and expected to cost in the order of $400,000. The next case is this internal fuel spillage of this approximately 7,000 dead weight ton passenger cruise vessel. It was reported that in order to undertake steelwork repairs for the emergency diesel generator room, it was necessary to drain the associated fuel tank. To achieve this, marine gas oil was being drained from the emergency general generator fuel tank to the overflow tank by means of a dedicated drain line using the tank's return overflow. Following the fuel transfer when laying alongside the harbor, Marine gas oil was observed to have flooded into the new shop area, and at this time, the marine gas oil was restricted to the starboard aft corner of the shop. It was initially estimated that around 250 to 500 liters of marine gas oil had leaked in during transfer, and with the chief engineer subsequently reporting a loss of approximately 800 liters of fuel. Ship staff removed the spilled fuel being pumped into jerry cans and subsequently disposed of uh, the contaminated marine gas oil in sludge tank. The spoke carpet and underlay was removed and transferred ashore to the contaminated waste skip for disposal. The aft shop interior's false bulkhead was opened up to reveal that fuel leakage had occurred just above the deck. This section of pipe that you see was found to be corroded and wasted in several places, noting that prior to the vessel's recent conversion, this pipe section was exposed, being outside on the open boat deck. Fail section of pipe is understood to be original from build, having been flanged to new pipe work that was installed. The following repairs would be required for the damage described. Cropping and renewing an approximately three linear meter section of corroded fuel tank drain line. Pressure test the fuel line following the section replacement. Removal of all affected in-way paneling. Electrical disconne disconnection and removal of shop units for access. Removal and disposal of oil-soaked carpet, lagging and screed, together with any adversely affected fixtures and fittings, removal replacement of shop window for ventilation, checking surfaces in the new shop for presence and levels of contaminants, thorough deep cleaning of, uh, to remove all traces of gas oil, screeding the shop deck and fitting of new carpet, relagging as required, which is considered most likely from the deck level to height of the first stringer above, uh, replacement refitting of the paneling with a renewal of contaminated panels as required, Replacement refitting, refitting of shop units, uh, and that is the renewal of all plinths and replacing the unaffected units. Disposal of the fuel contaminated waste, and of course, replacement of 800 liters of marine gas oil. Currently, the spilled marine gas oil has been cleaned up and disposed of in a, in a sludge tank. The oil soap carpet and underlay were removed, and, and that this was done ashore to the designated contaminated skip. The shop window at the ship side was removed for ventilation purposes. Fitters are dismantling the shop and have commenced the removal of some areas of contaminated lagging prior to rescreening the floor. The failed horizontal fuel pipe section in way of the shop has so far not been removed and repairs are currently anticipated to be completed within four to six working weeks for around $400,000 in conjunction with the owner's ongoing project works. 
Another case in November was this grounding of an approximately uh, 1,500 deadweight tan supply vessel. It was reported that the vessel grounded whilst departing and she was backed off after contact and proceeded to anchor. After an initial assessment, the vessel was escorted by another to have a dive survey conducted for a more detailed evaluation of the damage that was sustained. The following extent of damage was found from forward to aft. On the port side, from frame zero to frame 41, various damages included keel and bottom plate setting, <laughs> heavy deformation and scraping. The port fernstem cooler was damaged. Also, the forward section of the outboard and center cooler guard was deformed. On the starboard side, from frames 0 to 27, various damages also included keel and bottom plate setting, heavy deformation, and scraping. The following repairs would be required for the damage described. For the deformed bottom plate and internals, cropping to healthy metal and renewal of that, the scraped gouge plate sections will need to be cleaned, removed, uh, the old, old paint removed and recoated. And for the Fernstrom coolers, cropping the section of the outboard outboard and center guard plate and renewal of that, draining the cooler, unbolting from inside, lowering, removing, and replacing. The vessel has been hauled and repairs are scheduled to commence. It was informed that the steel thickness is half an inch for the affected bottom plate, and there's currently allowance for 50% of the steel weight for inter internal framing up to frame nine, and 25% of the steel weight for internal framing for the remainder of the repairs. This currently amounts to a rough steel weight calculation of 21,000 uh, pounds. A more exact calculation of the internal deformation can be made once the bottom plate has been partially cropped to allow access for a survey. The estimated cost of repairs are expected to be in the order of $600,000. And last for this month is the clutch failure of this approximately 190 deadweight ton harbor tractor tug. The tug was engaged in assisting a vessel to turn at port, and when the tug started pushing for the turn, the fire alarm was activated soon afterwards. It was first thought that smoke had been detected from cooking in the galley. However, after resetting, the fire alarm was reactivated, and at this time, the location of the fire was identified on the panel as the propulsion drive room. The chief engineer and motorman went to investigate, and they opened the hatch to the drive room. It was found filled with smoke and smelt of burnt friction material. On CCTV, the master saw what appeared to be as fire in the port aft drive room and ventilation was shut down. And then the master started maneuvering the tug alongside to the nearest berth. In the meantime, he ordered for hoses to be rigged up and the boundary cooling from the aft side was started. The fire department was noted through the tug dispatcher. A team from the fire department went down to the drive room and discharged a total of five portable fire extinguishers. It was identified that the source of the fire had been around port drive clutch arrangement. The fire department departed from the tug, and the tug then departed using the starboard drive only, and shortly afterwards berthed at the tug terminal. The following extent of damage was found to the port propeller drive. The clutch internal components consisting of inflatable tire and friction shoes were burnt and melted. The clutch drum showed surface cracks. The V-belt's driving steering gear pump was also burnt. The drive room and contents, including two diesel generator sets, stores, floor, plates, bilges, control panels, were completely covered in soot and ash. Four portable carbon dioxide fire extinguishers were consumed. The drive unit itself appeared not to be affected as after removal of the melted interfaces, it was possible to turn the drive by hand. The stub shaft inside the clutch was also found to be rotating by hand and there were no indications of bluing due to any overheating. The following repairs would be required for the damage described. Replacement of the complete clutch assembly, replacement of V-belts for the steering pump, cleaning of the drive room and contents, and alternators of the diesel generator sets to be opened up and coils to be cleaned. The tug managers forward a service engineer report with details of the testing uh, of the replaced clutch assembly. During the test, it was found that a pressure regulator providing air pressure to the inflatable tire in the clutch arrangement was not operating correctly, causing the clutch air pressure to fluctuate during the operation. Furthermore, a pressure sensor from the minimum clutch pressure alarm was found not to be operating correctly. Both components were renewed, after which the unit was tested during sea trials and found to operate again. The starboard clutch assembly was also inspected and found to operate correctly. The estimated costs of repairs are expected to be in the order of uh, $500,000. And um, that brings us to the end of this presentation. That's it for this month. Thank you for your attention. And I'll pass you back over to Steve.
Thanks, Ryang. Um, especially those online, if you can bear with us a couple of minutes, because um, we've got a set up for the panel discussion. So I should just keep talking for a little while to ensure that um, you all know that we're still here and we're live, etc. Um, what I didn't say earlier, by the way, which I should have said, um, I hope everyone has a nice Christmas. Um, I was going to sing a carol, but um, I've been asked not to sing. And I'll do my stand-up routine now as well. So we're all relying on technology. So this is a little bit different this month because, as I say, we have we have got a, a panel here of um, some of my esteemed colleagues who I shall introduce shortly. Um, also, please bear with me because we're expecting questions online and also questions from the um, audience here in London. So those in um, London, I shall repeat the questions so that the people online know what we're talking about. So as soon as, we good to go? It's okay. Fantastic, okay. I've worked with this bunch for several years and previously when I've introduced them, I've been rather flippant, so I've got a script. So, so I, I shall go from down here upwards. So I'll start with Mark McGowan. Mark is our Global Managing Director of Maritime, based in our London office for the last few years. He was previously in Singapore for 13 years. He's a marine engineer by trade, having worked on board and ashore in the container, offshore and passenger shipping industries. Prior to his career as a house of air, sorry, prior to his career as a house of air marine maritime consultant. That's trouble when you're reading, isn't it? Um, then we've got um, next to him, Pat Canny. Pat leads our maritime team for the Middle East and India. Uh, as with all our panel today, he comes from a seafarer background and since come to shore has been working with the ABL group for quite some time. He joined the Central Union of Marine Underwriters, C4, in Norway in 1992 to open the Middle East office of the Skewer Network. Pat represents the Nordic market still through his various and through the first mergers of Aquinas Bremer LO3 group. Pat has been engaged by PI clubs, Hull Machine Underwriters, ship owners and managers, ship repairs and maritime law firms surrounding marine casualties and obviously pre-risk work as well. Um, next, we've got John Walker. Now, John leads the maritime tour in, in the Americas. Once again, it sounds like a broken record. He's, he's an ex-chief going chief engineer and shipyard project manager. For the last 12 years, spent in marine casualty and investigation and salvage projects for the whole underwriters and PI clubs. Um, John was most recently chairman of the Association of Advertisers of the US and Canada, but also during COVID, that wasn't much use. Um, then we got Ivan Moriarty. Ivan is a master mariner with 18 years seagoing experience, mainly in the offshore sector, before moving into marine surveying when he moved to Singapore seven years ago. Specialised in marine warranty surveys, p and h &M attendance, as well as pre-risk surveys. And finally, we've got Jason Bennett. Jason leads ABL's group's salvage and record removal team globally. He's based here in London and heads up a team of uh, SCRs around the world. As an SCR himself, and today he, he will be giving adding questions to a salvage and record removal dimension. And having worked previously in the salvage industry, he's very capable of doing this. That's probably the nicest thing I've ever said about all five of these gentlemen, by the way. Um, so, so if anyone wants to start a question, if not, I do have some pre-loaded questions, but does anybody want to ask a question first off? Wow, shy audience, what have thought about this last? Okay, so I'll start with Ivan. So, Ivan, in your opinion, and then we'll share that around the rest of the guys, how has ABL managed to remain reactive and able to attend surveys offshore and onshore during COVID-19? And how has the pandemic impacted surveys? Let's just base it in Asia Pacific, because obviously that's your region. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, good. Sorry. Good. good morning, everyone. Um, regards the um, Singapore region, it hasn't really affected us too much because the authorities were very quick to recognize that the people in the marine sector were frontline workers. So they very quickly brought in um, PCR testing almost immediately. And we have a very, very effective track and trace system in Singapore. So we, it didn't hamper us 
in going out to the anchorages and to the to the shipyards um, because of of this effective regime. But in regards to carrying out the um, surveys in Asia, it was a little bit more tricky because Singapore um, they immediately shut their borders. So, for instance, normally if there was a casualty in, a, say, a remote part of Indonesia, we would normally mobilize from Singapore. So, because of the, the, the pandemic and the restrictions, we weren't able to do that. So, what we found ourselves doing was having to find somebody um, more local. And the challenge there is that sometimes these guys, they mightn't be so um, experienced in a particular type of of casualties. So what we were trying to do is we would coordinate it from Singapore, but we were doing it more on a mentoring role. So we'd we'd have to give a lot more guidance to these guys, kind of guide them along. And then, you know, when when they got on board, we'd try and connect with them remotely if they were having having any trouble or if they were unsure about something. And it it's generally worked well, you know. Um, Obviously, if you're in a region where you don't have a great phone coverage or signal, it's a challenge. But overall, it has worked well. And then I guess the other alternative we have is we've done we've done it remotely where we can't get a, a guy on board. And doing a remote survey can be challenging. It if it depends if it's if it's a localized one, if it's an area like a hollow machinery where you've damaged an area and if you providing you've a good signal, it can work. But if you're trying to do a whole vessel, like if, if you're trying to do a, a condition survey or a, a PNI or a JH survey or an OVID or a SIRE, where you're trying to um, cover the whole vessel, then that's challenging. But it's a remote survey is better than no survey, but I think it needs to be borne in mind that it's still better to be, to, to be able to physically attend. Thanks, Ivan. Um, John, what you'd like to put your yeah, good morning, everyone. So I think in the certainly in the Americas region, it's it has been maybe a little more challenging, just due to the geographical spread between countries. Uh, certainly in the Caribbean, we saw in some of the major offshore hubs like Trinidad were completely shut down um, until very recently. So trying to get into those offshore supply vessels down there was extremely um, difficult. So that and amongst uh, with Brazil had a big surge in uh, COVID, obviously, and that still continues there. So, but we have much the same as Ivan was saying is by spreading around our our team and um, making, making use of where they are while we manage to do most of the work without having people stuck in quarantine for extensive periods I mean sometimes that was unavoidable but I was hoping things were kind of getting back to normal over the last couple of months but we've taken a step back at, at the moment but we'll uh, yeah I think generally things have opened up now between Canada and the US has been was challenging for us backwards and forwards um, Fortunately, the governments did note that uh, surveyors and um, experts in that sort of field and ship repair were necessary um, essential workers and could transit backwards and forwards without too much hassle. But that did take um, quite a bit of lobbying from the uh, from the shipping uh, industry to to get both governments there to agree. So yeah, that covers it. Thanks, John. Uh, perhaps if you don't mind, to Middle East, please. Yeah, good morning, everyone. In the Middle East, I guess we've been rather fortunate that we have four very large yards within an hour's flight of where we are. Uh, some we can also reach by road. And the local governments fairly quickly established that uh, shipping was an uh, essential industry. So we, we were able to receive permission to to work, although it was a bit convoluted to obtain the permission through the police forces. But we were able to keep attending at shipyards in Oman, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, and in Qatar. And with that, we were able to offer our services to ship owners where they were unable to fly in superintendents and service engineers. So we we filled that gap a little bit in assisting them to get the ships dry docked. Thanks, 
Thanks, Pat. Um, so, Mark, would you like to give a global perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously, um, not to give a sales pitch because that's not my job, um, but uh, you know, we have we do have quite a large uh, global footprint, and uh, what we've definitely found through COVID, as I've mentioned before, is that we're using the closest body as opposed to perhaps prior to COVID, we would use the, the, the most specialist body. So whatever the vessel type was or the incident type was, we would send a specialist on a plane. We would go there, and, you know, we, we would get it sorted with our previous squad posters. Obviously, during COVID, we've not been able to travel as much or as freely as we could before. So we've utilised this, you know, this global footprint we've got to send the, uh, the closest person, which minimises travel, um, under the direction of uh, a specialist remotely. And I think you guys as an industry have responded very well to that. Um, obviously out of necessity during COVID. But I suspect actually moving forward past COVID, we may stick to some of these um, attendance principles because obviously it, it, it's cut down on travel time, it's cut down on travel cost, um, which obviously has a financial benefit to um, uh, to the market. I think uh, the market's come round to the idea that we can have a guy in attendance and another guy you know, pulling the strings remotely. And even though we obviously be charged for those two guys, it's still cheaper than, than, than putting people on a plane. And obviously, all of us work for big companies these days and, and, and uh, environmental considerations are of, of a great concern. So if we can keep people off airplanes, um, I think, you know, moving forward, um, it's probably going to, you know, going to look a lot more like that, even when COVID, hopefully, uh, as John said, we thought it had gone, but it's come back with a vengeance, um, as we found out last night. So hopefully, you know, post-COVID, when it does finally go away, I think we're still going to very much, uh, you know, be utilising uh, local guys um, with with remote oversight. I think I think one of the things as well that um, maybe would affect on the the underwriters a little more is uh, certainly with loss of hire and that side of things is uh, that supply chain issue, not necessarily for the surveyors, but what we've seen is um, delays in being able to get engine parts, moving engine technicians around, salvage equipment for big claims, and that has a big knock on effect there. Whereas before we may have been able to get parts air freighted in, shipped in quite quickly to get the ship underway again. That has had quite a big effect and continues to do so. We're still, um, that's not gone away yet and doesn't look like it's clearing up anytime soon. So that I'm sure for the underwriters is affecting, um, affecting those certainly loss of hire claims will be pushed up. And then things like overtime for technicians coming in because they are having to quarantine. And we've seen that on the major like rec removal projects will put people in a bubble, but we have to trade them out. Um, Obviously, that's additional cost for that sort of things. So, in general, what are the views of the panel that you can come up with some of the recent review conducted by Lloyds and subsequent continued support of the Lloyds Open Form system via the continued uh, endorsement <coughs> of the salvage arbitration branch? So I'm sure there's people interested in your comments on that. Thanks, Steve. That's the uh, most polite introduction I've had from him as well. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome is the first thing. It's welcome that Lloyds has decided to continue supporting via the salvage arbitration branch. And it, uh, it affects on many levels. First of all, Lloyds form itself. Yes, it's in decline. It's use of for various reasons, some real, some I think imagined. Uh, and there have been various measures over the years to address that. And hopefully as a community, we can recognise that and support it because fundamentally for the big crisis, it is by far the best solution commercially, contractually. It's simple. It was designed, don't forget, by the market for that purpose. Um, if Lloyds had decided not to support it, then I, it may have found a house somewhere else to administer it, to administer the process, but that would be difficult because you need that independent body, uh, an impartial body. And so for the, its particular use in Burnsies, that is vital that it keeps going. If you look at a bit of wider context, if you look at the maritime field in London in particular, then it's an integrated body. We operate as a body of insurers, lawyers, support systems, consultants, surveyors like ourselves, etc. And although by proportion of value and numbers, the Lloyd's form has decreased over the years, I think it's still vitally important as a core service but also as part of the image, it's as a, of London itself. So if that had gone, then I think it would have been detrimental to A, the salvage industry, B, the wider marine industry, and C, uh, London itself as a maritime hub. It would have some effect greater probably than its uh, commercial value. 
Does that suit? Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, anybody else in the panel got anything to add to that? Or shall I? Does anybody from the audience have any questions? Anyone online at the moment? Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, we were going to have Paul Hill here. Unfortunately, Paul's not too well. So there were a couple of questions, Paul, but I'm sure with this panel, one of them will be able to fill in. So, what do you consider to be the predominant cause of chemical tanker? Tank coating failures in recent years. Um, I see Paul's been involved with the Joint Health Committee on the new JH wording for that. And maybe I'll phone Mark McGowan under the bus as he's the global press. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and thanks to Paul for not showing up. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, as, as he said, so Paul's been, been linked with the Joint Health Committee. Um, so we've now got a new. Uh, 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 pre-risk survey in place so under the JH survey, which can help us, you know, better to identify um, what sort of standard of of coating, um, you know, we're trying to deal with what those conditions and the quality, I think more importantly, of, of the coatings, um, you know, we can expect to what sort of period of time they might stand up for, how long um, and, and how well they can withstand what it is they need to do. Obviously, a lot of uh, tank coating issues, um, it's not just about the product, it's about preparation and application. And that certainly is something we see a great um, variance of across the globe, different yards, different facilities. Um, and that's why this this new JH survey will hopefully give us a better handle on on, on what risk we can explain better to underwriters, or, you know, what level of risk is involved depending on where it's done and how it's done. Thank you, Mark. Imagine I've got lawyers in the room and neither of them ask a question. It must be because they're not charging. Anyway, <laughs> um, there's a question. The offshore industry is starting to get back price and demand increase. How has this affected laid up vessels and reactivation? Maybe John and Ivan, if you could have a couple. Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, we're certainly seeing that now with um, a lot more of the, off the offshore installations um, going ahead, projects that have been on hold for a while. And, and with that, over the last, I would say, probably four years, um, have been a lot of, certainly in my area in the, uh, the Gulf Coast region of the US and Mexico, a lot of offshore supply vessels, construction vessels have been laid up for significant times and not always with the normal layup warranties or, or provisions in place due to cut budgets from operators, that sort of thing. So the ones we are seeing, while they, they may be getting up to speed quite quickly in terms of their equipment on board, the accommodations, uh, the machinery hasn't really been looked after. So just just in terms of crew accommodations, um, I was looking at one recently, there was nearly $2 million needed spending on a fairly small supply vessel just to get rid of mold and, and that sort of thing. So you can imagine there, if that hasn't been looked after and dehumidified, the engine room was not in the best state either. So even with a quick oil change and service of the engines, there's potentially quite a lot, I think, where it does it does need quite a lot of oversight before these vessels go back to work. Um, so yeah, I don't know if uh, I've seen, seen similar, similar out in there. The, yeah, I think, I think, sorry, my, my laptop's gone dead, so I'll join in here. Um, I think a lot of it, the reactivation, the ease of the reactivation depends on what kind of a, a layup the vessel was on. So if it was on a, a warm layup where you have uh, a skeleton crew on board that can um, regularly um, run the engines and things, it's not so hard. But if it's a cold layup, it's a lot more, more complicated. And I think from a generally class and flag will make sure that the vessel is up to spec. But I think for a H&M and P&I perspective, I think they need to be looking at what the vessel is actually, that it's fit for purpose for the space, say if it's an offshore vessel, what that particular project is. And I think that's maybe where we come in, where the the condition surveys that we do are, we, we focus more on those areas. So um, I think, as I say, for a, H&M perspective, that's that's important to, to consider what it's actually going to be used for. Thank you, guys. So, in the cruise ship industry, bouncing back after COVID restrictions, fingers crossed, what, what are the H&M problems that you have seen? So, 
Well, Mark, would you like to start off? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, cruise ship is my favourite subject. Um, very fond memories of sailing with John many years ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, what we've seen with, with, with cruise ships is, I mean, as Ivan said, a lot of it, um, same with the offshore market, it's about reactivation. Um, but actually, what we saw with the cruise market is that the vessels weren't laid up in a traditional sense because they most of them remained at their certainly from a technical point of view at the manning levels that they've always remained at so they might have been you know laid out we've all seen the pictures of them all you know down in weymouth harbour and there have been loads in tilbury and obviously lots in the philippines and miami um there's uh they they were generally manned and this actually gave the cruise operators um quite a lot of opportunity to carry out quite a bit of maintenance that perhaps they wouldn't have been able to do before because they were uh, they were operating so actually we didn't see as big a drop in claims notifications as, as you might have thought because the vessels weren't in service because a lot of the things that were found which sometimes result in claims were found because you know the crews had an opportunity to really really dig into these vessels um obviously there is uh, or there was hopefully now they're back in service not so much there was quite a significant aggregated risk of having all these vessels um in these ports for a long period of time, which they weren't usually before. If you were to take a snapshot of a, of a port like Miami, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but most days before COVID, there would be quite a few vessels in there. So those things still occurred, but the difference was these vessels were staying there for you know for long periods of time. Um, what what we've certainly seen is that that now that they're entering service again, obviously the machinery is being run, um, you know, more hours are going on them. So we are anticipating you know a bit of an uptick in in, in claims coming. Uh, coming the market's way but generally as i said it's it's not you know we haven't seen many big cruise ships in what we would consider cold or even warm layout to be honest with you they, they've they've generally been manned the machinery's been on um and and they do move around a bit a lot of the the cruise operators have been moving their vessels around um perhaps for their instagram feeds their social media feeds um which also leads to you know quite an interesting point we've had some questions from underwriters are they you know are they laid up you know, we've had operators asking for uh, deductions in their in their premiums because they're laid up, and then we get a question. Well, hang on, I thought this vessel was laid up, but now I see it's moved from, you know, uh, the, the 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 east coast of the states over to the over to the Mediterranean for for a photo opportunity. So, you know, were they laid up or were they not? So it will certainly be interesting um, in what's time to come. But obviously, we we certainly hope that uh, the cruise market will be you know back to where it was very shortly. Anything to add, John? No, I think you pretty much covered it there, but there is sort of, as I mentioned, with the that with everything being down um, in Miami, for instance, that there's a huge support industry that goes with that, and a lot of that has collapsed in the wake of them not being able to service those um, ships. So that's going to need a big rebuild as, as the um, ships start trading again. And I'm talking everything from restaurant supplies to parts supplies, bunkers. Uh, that's really all got to gear up again and of course it, it will happen but it has had quite a big knock-on effect on the abilities of small repair shops for instance who would normally come in and do a quick bit of welding uh, interior fit out stuff servicing fire extinguishing systems there obviously that hasn't been happening as frequently so that, that's all going to need yeah taking up i think that's the other part really to add on that and uh, so, Simon Jackson from Clyde's. I, I, I'll repeat the question anyway, so for the... Um... Chris, you, you picked up there on some of the, kind of the, the processing that happened over the pandemic, the layoffs, and what they're going to do. In terms of the casualties you've seen, have you seen anything different in the casualties over the pandemic? Is it more of the same, less of the same, different trends? So that's just so for the online. So that's different trends in casualties over during COVID. Yeah. Um, Pat, you've been quiet. So why not? Why don't you we start with this? Many questions. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't see there's any increase in trends of casualties. We have been busy. I, I would say almost at the same level. Our utility remains at the same height. Uh, there is, I wouldn't say there's any particular trend on casualties. The, the one thing that I would note or would put to the audience is if I drill down to most of the casualties, I'm looking at the quality of people on board the ships. 
and it may mark me as a dinosaur, but to me that's one of the most important facts. If you have a vessel at sea today and you're covering that risk, is the quality of the people that the owner or the manager puts on board. And if you look at the vessels which are coming into service, the technology which is on board those vessels, the value of those vessels, and the potential for disaster with some of these vessels, uh, with an LNG, ammonia coming into the picture, my biggest fear would be where would we get the quality of the crew to run these vessels in future? If, if I can pick up a bit on just uh, on some of the other trends, I think one of the uh, things we have seen is an increase in repair prices globally, uh, whether that's for machinery, whether for hull damage, uh, cost of salvage. And I think one thing we've got to prepare for is with the inflationary pressures we've seen um, worldwide in the next year or so, whether whether the market will react to that in increased premiums, whether they will bear that. But certainly that inflation is going to come into repair costs and um, affect affect pretty much the claims if it if it tracks the same way as well as the consolidation with some of the uh, major manufacturers of machinery like Rolls-Royce. Um, there aren't that many options um, for ship owners to go out and get different repairs now. So engine manufacturers is really only a few big manufacturers now, and that all almost monopolizes who can repair things and what rates they'll charge. And they'll pretty much use that inflation as an excuse for the higher rates for um, technical labor parts, and I think we'll see that coming into the casualties continue that increasing uh, trend of repairs. So, to repeat the question for you, so it's a loss of container in the cargo underwriter loss in the car for the cargo perspective. Yeah, so. uh, Jason, would you like to? Thanks. Um, it's quite a broad question, actually, because there's a few causes to it. I don't know necessarily there's an increased pressure for ships just to steam full ahead, but if you look at containerized transportation in general, there have been some notable cases. I mean, recently we have seen, uh, for the first time in quite a while, the first actual total loss of a vessel with the Express Pro. that has been there for a while. Others, you've had substantial bits of the vessels, and as far as money goes, substantial amounts lost, but not technically the whole vessel. Um, and a lot of that was from fires. Um, and you've had various investigations into that, and they're ongoing. Similarly, you had some notable cases with containers like toppling. And I was involved when I was still doing the salvage side, the recovery of um, several hundred containers off the North Dutch coast. And that uh, that was something which didn't happen before, maybe to the extent it was done. So the costs are up and the cargo is a big impact by it. The question, question, I suppose, is there a problem is one question, because yes, there's an issue. Uh, and particularly with fires, any issue with that brings threatens the vessel, also the crew on board. So you start with threats to life. That's always an issue. If you were cynical and, and for a few years, you might think, well, if you're a container operator and you have X numbers of fires on one zip and the cost of this, then that's a cost of doing business type thing. But I think, I think it's gone beyond that. I think, yes, there is a problem. How to tackle it? And there's no one answer from that one. Um, there are various studies going on, both to the what's, how they lost overboard for various reasons, and over the years, various causes, parametric rolling, the types of lashings, where it's secured or not, container weights, uh, misdeclared or undeclared cargoes. Um, there's a recent case by the Danish, I think it's DBI, Danish Institute, looking at fires, looking right down to how do fires spread from containers? Is it from the bottom, from the top, from the sides, from the doors? The basics of that. And that, I think the first report is out now. And I think the conclusion is that it has to be tackled on many ways. Technology is one aspect, but technology on the ships, better detection early on, issues of does CO2, is that really effective, going around holes which are full of boxes, etc. cetera, uh, more monitors are required, do you have enough crew to do it? 
technology further down the, up the line, weighing containers at every point to make sure the weights are correct before they're stacked on board the ships for container blowing over. All those points need addressing. And there is work. I think now the realisation is there that something does need to be done and some things have been done, but there's more to do. But also I think that technology alone cannot solve the problem. Socially as well, the number of crew, type of crew, training on board, however good your crew are, the numbers now, if you use them, A, you're on board a ship, which is your home, your lifeboat, your best lifeboat is a ship, and it's on fire. It's Your stress levels are up. And after 24 hours of fighting a fire, you'll be worn out, whoever you are, and however good you are. So calling for assistance if it's there promptly, not waiting until it's the last minute is one aspect. So I think an integrated approach is needed. There's no easy solution. I think, yes, the industry is recognising there is a problem. It's not just a matter of, OK, this happens so often. Setting aside the fact that any threat to life is not acceptable on that basis. But even economically, it's not acceptable. But it cannot be tackled by technology alone. It cannot be tackled by technology on the ship or shore side alone. It has to be addressed on several factors, including the, the um, socio factor of it as well. There is no one big solution, but yes, the drives we've seen, the studies to narrow it down on a rather than an ad hoc, oh, I feel it feels about right basis, but really get some hard data on it is happening. That needs to continue happening. And it, it will involve costs somewhere down the line and more than one party will have to pay some cost. And then dealing with the issue once it comes to light afterwards, that can reduce costs as well. How things are settled, how things are dealt with as a claim, that can be looked at as well. And I think there's scope along all the chain, wherever you're looking at, to do more, and it needs to continue. Okay. Yeah, continuing on the same, same form, we have been involved in quite a few... on the matter of fires. And personally, having been on board several mm -hmm. container ships that were on fire, and having spoken with the owners and the class, I think it's accepted that the fire subdivision of the vessels is now not sufficient, nor is the installed fire suppression systems sufficient. It's not enough to put CO2 into a huge cargo hold. One vessel, the smaller vessel I dealt with, had drenchers fitted into the hatch covers, which would, they actually were used, the fire was on top of the hatch covers, but they were able to at least use them to prevent from the fire below hatches. The larger vessel that I was involved with I had no such suppression system and at the end of the fire, by the time the vessel had been salved, there was nothing remaining of the three forward holds. All of the transverse bulkheads had melted and were gone with a heap in the bottom of the hold. So I think it, owners and class have to be serious. They want to carry these cargoes, they're going to have to build the ships sufficiently strongly and sufficiently protected to give cargo underwriters some security. And talking about crews, I went on board one 12 hours after the onset of the fire. At that time, the crew were already exhausted. So 24 hours, if not, and they were kaput, they were done. Anybody else? No? Is that Mike? Is that? Well, we've got two questions on the bounce. We don't go for a hat trick. Fantastic. John, thank you. I, I can ask the panel to put pictures so that people know. I can ask the say, there's a couple of programs for a foreign specialty. Normally, there is a program for um, remote vessels with some crew then to be free with the remote vessels, very clearly and then fully autonomous vessels and make that AI which is launched as a captain So it's not really that autonomous vessels might be something in the future. I'm just wondering from you know, the expert plan on how to do what we might see in the future when we've got portions with fully autonomous vessels going to 
ships. So this question is about autonomous vessels and how it may affect casualties. Yeah, John? And he works with us, so he's really throwing him a curveball. <laughs> I'll take that one if you want. Um, I, I think, yes, on the short, short sea shipping routes, ferries, we're already seeing that development. But I was involved with the panel talking on this um, a few years ago, and the panel were very much made up of developers and designers of autonomous vessels. So their perspective may have been a little bit biased. And I was looking at it from the perspective of a seafarer who made my career at sea so it was um i was a little bit bouncing it back to them but no one had a good answer of when you're at sea you're walking through the engine room you're walking along the decks and you're constantly got your eyes open and you've got your tools in your hand and you're fixing stuff as you go if you've got an autonomous vessel running around and i'm not saying it's not possible we'll have robots fixing this stuff in the future but i'm not quite sure we're there yet when you've got a fuel pipe that starts leaking in an engine room who's actually going to fix that and fix that gland that's leaking before it becomes a major fire so with respect to casualties i don't think we're quite there yet maybe with the short sea stuff where it could be stopped and inspected uh, on a daily basis or every few hours maybe but it's still going to take human interaction at the moment but i don't know 30 40 years time maybe so the Nor there's a Norwegian company, I can't remember the name, but they are a fertilizer manufacturer and they have already commenced using an autonomous vessel on short sea route from two ports within Norway and it's covered, I think it's covered by Norwegian Hull Club and they, they all have an interest in how this works. I know there's enough data yet, but part of the driver for that is that it takes some 40,000 truckloads of fertilizer off the roads. So it works on an ESG side and the environment. I do not know how they deal with the uh, provision of some backup crew on board. But it's, I take John's point that it will take some time, maybe not 40 years. I think, I think also, also we, we need to ask ourselves what's the driver for this? What's the driver for autonomous vessels? Is it to improve safety at sea? Um, is it to save cost? And really cost is going to be the driver from an owner's point of view. And if we look at the operating costs of an average vessel, of course, an average vessel doesn't exist, so I, I shouldn't even be saying it. But if we look at the roughly, when we look at a broad spectrum of commercial seagoing vessels, the crew cost is usually about, it's only about 5% of the operating cost of the entire vessel. 50 odd percent is fuel, 15 to 20% goes to the insurance market on the premiums, then there's maintenance, there's parts, but for only 5% is crew, which has put us in an awkward position because actually if you look at all those other costs, the only there's only one cost really the, the operator can control and, and that's crew. And what we've seen obviously over the past 20, 30, 40 years is, is, is a reduction in the quality and therefore the cost of the crew. So what's incentivizing these ship owners to invest in autonomous technology? Because they've they've already got that cost down to really almost immaterial compared to the overall cost. I, I take, certainly take John's point. Most of the people we see within the industry who are championing this are people who are developing the technology to do so. But if I was a ship owner, it would certainly not be at the top of my list of, you know, of things to do because, as I say, that crew cost isn't the big barrier to, you know, to my profit. That it's already quite a small part of what we're doing. We saw a lot more casualties, by the way. But there may just be a coincidence. <laughs> um, got a question, Tony? Sorry. Um, looking at the And the other given is the only in many ways I think it's created or helped to create the problem because it's just the encouragement factor of that way. What do you think we should be doing to ensure we've got the right sort of equipment in the right places to deal with the future? So, so to paraphrase that for those online, it's basically those large container vessels, how we've got to deal with large 
yeah. lots of the equipment that's available. So I guess that's really for Jason to start with. Thanks. Thanks for that, Tony. Um, I'm going to start with the politician's answer and answer the different questions to begin with. Um, just going back, though, to the Lloyd's Farm question, because it has a little bit of an impact on this, is why I didn't mention I should have done, and other panellists reminded me, it's the people really matter as well. Unlike other contracts, the Lloyd's Farm, the value of it is decided afterwards, and that's based on the system working. And without the system being there, it fails to work. So if you lose the knowledge, if people... Lloyd's Farm goes down to an extent where we don't use it for 10 years and then people decide to rejuvenate it again, it'll be very hard to start again. It's uh, analogous to the Royal Navy with no fixed wing fighter pilots for a few years. Yes, they have them now. But if you look on board the carrier, half of them are Americans because they need to build the knowledge back. And it'd be very hard to get that knowledge back if you've lost it in the first place. Um, which doesn't come to this direction, but I will come to that now. As far as technology goes, to, I don't know there is a specific way you can address the technology for a one size all here's a crane available you can do it this has been looked at before yes you are quite right the size of these vessels is beyond the scope of most and nearly all cranes that you'll see around available wherever you are there are a small handful of units around the world and they will take a long time to mobilize so time will be a factor and it may be yes we can have a small number around the world because they have employment in other other things building etc um and it will take time now the impact of that we've seen with the ever given the economic impact is massive um because demands and everybody's was used to everything working just in time that it has knock-on effects are instantaneous and wide-reaching there were looks at before of could we have these kits positioned around the world and then you hit the usual barriers of who's going to do it, who's going to pay for it, where they're going to be positioned and who has access to them. There have been projects via uh, prior to the merge of one company I worked on, wasn't working at the time, they designed a crawler crane which could go on top of a massive container ship and would help unload from on board the ship. That stopped at the in the research phase where it needed injection of let's say 20 million to get it going and that if it had gone to fruition you'd have a unit which you could mobilize and deploy and in some cases not all could help to offload but who owns it who has access to it how many are going to build and i don't think the industry is united enough to solve that problem and it's been around for about 30 years since the since well thinking about 30 years 20 years getting more important last 10 years oh look they're here they're not over horizon they hear the ships um there will always be the traditional salvage approach which has been ad hoc uh be building a roadway out of sand digging a hole in the center with sky crane with big helicopters putting on board a tower crane and offloading that way those are innovative solutions and they will be there if the skill sets are still there within the industry across the industry to apply them and that can reduce the time factor down but if you're talking the fact that two three four five days becomes a critical time factor i don't know that there is a way of resolving that that is something which have to be dealt with in in other ways i think technology unless you could have self-unloading super container ships but I, you're not going to have enough jumbo cranes around the world the cost of them is substantial they're not economically viable to sustain themselves just on the ad hoc, a bit like station tugs. How many station tugs do you have? In theory, actually, I'll say probably, I'll go as far as I say really none hanging around, apart from government sponsored ones, which makes you question why they've been withdrawn a few years back by the government because of cost. Same answer for cranes, you wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. So, sustaining industry which can help redact and adapt rapidly in a few days is the answer, I think. Okay, um, I'm aware of time. I'm normally in the audience, so I've got to speed up. So it's 10.33 now, UK. If there's no further questions, oh, so he's just, he's got lively now, so can't tell me. I think that might be so. That's an alternative still for um, ship construction. If John used to work in the ship construction industry, I think that should really be for him. 
Okay, um, yeah, I think really it is, it, at the moment, steel is still going to be the go-to. I can't see that changing. Really, just that's the way shipyards are geared up. That's the, the raw materials, the production is, is there. It's well understood in terms of strength and yield, and uh, the structural design of that is, is very well developed. So I think it would be more specialist vessels, as you mentioned, yachts, um, have been for a long time where weight is critical and uh, stiff, stiffness of the hull, that sort of thing, is can be engineered into the into the composites. So I, I think that is really, unless you're looking to build a lightweight vessel, so maybe a fast ferry or that sort of thing. I think the industry is generally going to go more with with steel and then some yeah, some of the bigger fast ferries, are obviously in aluminium. Um, so I, I think that I don't know if that answers the question, Tony, but. I, I can't see that changing unless it's for a very specific reason, although of course steel, steel does have quite a big uh, impact on the uh, greenhouse gases needed to, to produce it. And uh, But then again, so does uh, so does carbon fibre. That's not uh, exactly a net zero production method. So. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you for everyone coming along. If you, uh, if you do have any more questions, um, please either email him with you online or um, the guys are still here. We've also got um, several other surveyors in the audience from from Greece, Varna, and the Middle East. So please be free to, to ask them anything. Um, obviously, every month we have our prize draw for the questions that uh, Katie sends out uh, for the bottle of champagne, which is seriously was that's the reason it was on the table. It wasn't just so they if, just in case they got thirsty. Um, so we'll be sending out the questions of the uh, um, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, but last month was, um, and I do apologise for my pronunciation, Chiaki Kawachina. Fantastic. <laughs> I do apologise from CJC. <laughs> yeah, please, 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 please. Do you want to? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you've got to have the photograph as well. <laughs> There's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> um, uh, as I say, many thanks for coming along. Um, hopefully we'll be here next month, next year, um, where we'll have Paul Hill presenting on um, what has happened this year, even though I think we know what happened this year, and what's going to happen hopefully next year. Um, I think that's on about the 14th of January, 13th of January. Um, for those who are in London, uh, it's obviously our client reception tonight um, in a bar that I know around the corner, uh, Lock Fine. So if any of you have, didn't get the invite or you want to come along, please feel free. Uh, but please keep safe. Lovely seeing you. Happy New Year.